Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Don't Risk It podcast presented by VFIS Client Risk Solutions. This program focuses on the exposures our clients frequently encounter and discusses some potential solutions to help reduce these exposures. I'm your host, Chris Rogers, with VFIS Client Risk Solutions, and today we're talking with Tracy Young Brungard. Tracy is the Director of Recruitment and Retention within the Office of the State Fire Commissioner's Office of Pennsylvania. Tracy's here to discuss incident rehab and how this concept applies to emergency services. Tracy, I want to thank you for joining me today, and it's a pleasure to have you back on the program. Glad to be back. Good to hear. So to open up the uh, line of questioning, can you, uh, can you define what incident rehab is? So depending on the source, incident rehab can be defined in various ways, but a simple answer is it's an intervention practice to help mitigate undue stress, whether physical or emotional, um, reducing the potential exposure of personnel participating in operations at an incident scene to decrease those potential for injury, medical condition, and death. So how do we identify or, or, you know, basically how should we identify who should go through incident rehab? So again, from a, a local perspective or practices, uh, rehab policies and procedures are the responsibility of each organization, and those processes need to be established and communicated before an incident. Local policies, procedures, and practices should be established of who goes through the rehab, but anyone who is physically doing tasks should be going through rehab. Just a few examples are firefighters, rescues, rescuers at technical rescues, support personnel, so those are supporting exterior operations, and EMS and rehab personnel. Um, There's a lot of times with uh, incidents, especially those that are a long operational period, consideration needs to be given to those who are doing the rehab. So we say rehab for the rehab people and making sure that support personnel who may be functioning as like equipment or supply personnel, these individuals also need to need a break Um, So we want to make sure that they are also receiving the rehab. So why should we go through the rehab process? Is it it safety focused or, you know, what's what's the primary goal uh, of that process? So I'm going to counter that and say, why wouldn't someone want to go through rehab? From either perspective, it's about identifying, mitigating through interventions, a condition that may otherwise go undetected, which could lead to serious health conditions, disability now and into the future, and those including death. We've heard many stories uh, that have been shared where there's been a condition identified in the rehab process that warranted immediate attention and has saved many lives. So a wide variety of identified conditions among diverse age groups, including younger personnel that are presented during rehab, such as an active MI, high blood pressure, prolonged QT syndrome, narrow wide pulse pressures, just to name a few. And I'm sure there's a list of others that have been identified and provided interventions for. We must change the way we think regarding our own health and wellness, the health and wellness and well-being of those who work beside us. And it's not just for officers, but firefighters, municipal leaders, EMS, and uh, we're all in this together. So, you know, in our line of work, fire and EMS are are all programmed to react to situations in, you know, a crisis. Um, The culture needs to change a little bit to really address the health and well-being of responders. We need to be more proactive and open to different practices that benefit our well-being instead of reacting to the bad situation, which may come along, you know, in a current incident or even years later after the incident is over. So what about, uh, you know, in regards to uh, rehab, is this something that, you know, we kind of have to force the hand to some degree because, you know, the younger we are, the more invincible that we think we are. Uh, so is this, uh, is this something that we have to kind of force the hand or, or, or is it a, volu- a voluntary concept? I think it's a mix of both. Um, there are a lot of agencies out there that are very proactive and do participate in rehab. And like I said, it is a change in culture. So I think it's just realizing from an organizational perspective, um, the importance of why we do this and why we need to establish these practices. So can you elaborate on some of the things your organization does to conduct rehab and and why they're important? Sure. Um, So again, there's many different resources, published best practices out there that organizations can use to develop and improve their ability to provide good rehab. Some of the things that have been done in Pennsylvania just prior to COVID was addressing the reduction of field contamination from the information published in the Lavender Report. That document provided actions firefighters needed to take to lessen the risk of occupational exposure to cancer. 
We did see a wide variety of practices implemented by our training sites and fire departments. But during the public health emergency with the COVID, our training and testing sites were required to implement what we refer, we referred to as a personal protective plan or a PPP. Um, some sites incorporated both the field reduction contamination practices with the PPP practices and are continuing to do those today. So one example I can share from my own fire department who actually has an EMS component and does the rehab for the county training and testing site is there is a process document where policies and processes were developed and implemented from an organizational uh, perspective. And in that, the rehab process document provides the policy, the outline of processes, the appropriate setup with diagrams for different layout configurations determined on wind direction and training activities. It does include a list of medical equipment required for standard rehab and as well as a standard rehab form that we use. The reason that we use the standardization of the process document and the form is to ensure consistency. So if it's not our staff doing the rehab, um, those who are coming in and providing rehab ser services, the expectation is they will use that standard process. So an example of that is live fire evolution. A firefighter exits the structure if they're in a task position, they're required to go to rehab. The first thing they do is they stand in front of the fan. Um, then they will proceed to the staging area where they remove their PPE and turnout gear, then report to rehab where they receive a wet towel with soap that they'll wipe down face, hands, and arms. Then they drop that towel into a designated bucket or receptacle. Um, they proceed to the chair where they are provided another clean towel to wrap around their neck, uh, wipe off their face again, and a cold bottle of water. They sit for a few minutes before vitals are taken, and then EMS provides the determination after the assessment based on the parameters that are in the BLS guidelines, whether they return to duty or stay for further evaluation or they're released back to duty. So why is it? Uh, so why is incident rehab so important? Is it from the focus of, or from the perspective of an injury that might have happened at the job site, you know, like a broken finger or something like that, or a long-term, you know, uh, illness like cancer or, or or some type of uh, illness like that that presents itself later? So we might have touched on this earlier, but I think that um, it's important for everybody to return home safe to families and loved ones. But we all, as firefighters, EMS providers, um, we must be diligent about maintaining our health and well-being well -being, excuse me, of our fire and EMS personnel. The jobs and tasks that are performed are dangerous, not just the physical danger, but exposure to toxins and, mental, and the mental aspect. So if we can reduce the number of exposures by simple task of field reduction contamination, we can identify medical conditions or even a behavioral change as individuals go through the rehab process. That's one less life-altering event that would hinder the ability of a fire and EMS personnel to continue in this line of work. But bigger yet, it is one life saved. So to, to round out the line of questioning here, uh, you know, we're very big on documenting and in, uh, in emergency services. Um, what information should be documented in the incident rehab process? So I will preface it and say that it's really up to the local organizations to establish a process and the information that would be documented. However, the following information can be used as a guide to develop or and or revised documents. So the personnel name, the age, medical history, medications, allergies, emergency contact, uh, contact number. In addition, we want to have a set of baseline vital signs uh, to make sure that as they go through the rehab process on the different incident evolutions or training evolutions that those that are making the evaluation have a baseline to go by and make the determination if they are fit for duty and continue. So we want to look at, you know, making sure a vital sign, a full set of vital signs, blood pressure, pulse, respiration, temperature, um, are also captured. And again, the here in Pennsylvania, the BLS protocols provide a guideline to those acceptable ranges. Um, it's also with the COVID and the flu, we got into the practice of asking for those that are symptomatic or asymptomatic. So any type of cold, flu, respiratory, just not feeling that they're normal. Um, we, we want that to be accounted for in the evaluation, but we also want to know how many cylinders um, were used for each evolution um, if they're wearing an SCBA during that incident training. So um, 
again, other items in our, our fire department noted on the rehab form is uh, field contamination of the equipment and the turnout gear and personnel before they leave the incident because, again, we want to reduce that exposure. Um, it's also important to, to document any incident. So was it an injury? doesn't matter how minor. Is it a near miss? Is it an exposure? Did they have a medical event or a traumatic event that occurred? And again, using the appropriate paperwork for the appropriate injury or incident that happened. And this, again, it can all be determined by the process at the lowest jurisdiction. In addition, the NFPA does have several standards that people can use as a reference as far as NFPA 1584. And the U.S. Fire Administration actually has a booklet on emergency incident rehabilitation. Well, Tracy, that's a lot of great information, and I really appreciate you joining us on the program again, and uh, I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. And I want to thank you for listening to the program and for your interest in VFIS safety resources. I want to thank our guest, Tracy Young-Brungard, once again for her time and information. Please consider subscribing to our program to stay up to date on new content releases. Also, if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving a review below. For more information about the many resources available from VFIS, please visit VFIS.com. And to submit ideas for future discussions, please reach out by email at VFISriskcontrol at VFIS.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this program are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Gladfelter Insurance Group, VFIS, and its employees. Additionally, all views, information, or opinions expressed are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal, medical, or other professional advice on any subject matter.